Hi, everyone. My name is Murnal, and I am CTO at Occam, and I'm here to talk to you about trust and the Internet of Things. Uh, this talk uh, starts off at a very high level and then kind of drills deep into how to achieve trust in Internet of Things deployments uh, with InfluxDB. And um, throughout the course of the talk, I have lots of references in the slides that I will not go into the details of. Uh, but the slides will be available later and you can check out uh, the various references um, when, you, when you look at the slides. All right, so let's dive in. IoT, um, according to McKinsey, uh, will have an economic impact between 4 trillion and 11 trillion by 2025. Um, this digitization of the physical world or the internet of things has opened up tremendous new opportunities um, across industries, right? Uh, there's the opportunity to use IoT to lower costs and improve efficiency of operations. Um, you can use it to enhance the safety of the people working um, in your factories and, uh, and warehouses. You can improve it to uh, use it to improve customer experience, like you can have learn devices that learn using AI and you can personalize the experience your customer has. Um, and then of course you can have new kinds of revenue streams from new connected products. Um, and um, and th th this is a snapshot of uh, various benefits as various le um, sort of uh, enterprise leaders see. Um, this was a survey from Microsoft um, some time ago. Here's one example, one concrete example. Unplanned, unplanned downtime costs industrial manufacturers an estimated 50 billion annually. And um, McKinsey found that um, IoT enabled predictive maintenance can typically reduce machine downtime by 30 to 50 percent and of course increase machine life by 20 to 40 percent. So these kinds of transformative operation uh, opportunities um, uh, there, there, there's a large number of them across industries. Um, and typically to successfully leverage these opportunities, we require some kind of convergence of technologies. IoT with edge computing, with AI, with cloud computing, everything kind of has to come together uh, for such solutions to deliver value. Uh, so we need you know, the ability to sense the physical world, we need cheap low latency connectivity, we need the ability to analyze large amounts of data, we need algorithms that can detect significant events from those, that large amount of data, we need algorithms that learn and improve the quality of the decision uh, based on historical data, um, we need systems that can automate all of this and can make decisions on our behalf at the right time. And of course, then we need the ability to actuate these decisions in the physical world, the second half of IoT, if you will. And the Influx Data Platform excels at many of the components needed for this convergence. Um, for instance, the, um, the uh, you know, IoT data is time series data, and that's a very natural fit for InfluxDB. Uh, which has been designed and optimized for dealing with um, uh, time series data. Um, IoT data streams uh, typically require real-time processing and reaction, and uh, both Capacitor and InfluxDB make that kind of thing really easy. Um, and uh, the, the various programs in the tick stack come as Go self-contained binaries, and these binaries are really easy to deploy and manage in edge computing environments. And of course, Telegraph makes it easy for us to collect data from various different machine data sources. So the Influx Data Platform um, is, a re is really well suited for several of these IoT systems. Um, and since these use cases are transformative, they're also mission critical for the business, right? So for IoT solutions to be adopted, they must be reliable, dependable, and trustworthy. And that unfortunately is an area where IoT hasn't done so well, right? Over, over the last several years, there has been uh, a large number of attacks on all sorts of systems. We first saw it in like, you know, trivial home devices uh, and that culminated in the Mirai botnet where someone took over 600,000 um, various connected devices in our houses that had some, uh, you know, small number of default passwords and used that to attack the entire internet. Uh, but then slowly from like small home applications, it transitioned into critical uh, scenarios, right? Uh, whether it was, you know, someone showing how to stop a stop a running Jeep, or the uh, the Triton uh, malware, which is uh, which has been found to shut uh, to, to it's it's been shutting down and disabling uh, critical safety infrastructure industrial environments. Um, so something is fundamentally wrong with 
um, with how we deal with security and privacy in IoT. It's, I, I think it's too difficult and too expensive to build and maintain secure and private, private IoT systems. And without security and privacy, our solutions cannot be reliable, dependable, and trustworthy. So we kind of have to go back to our basics, right? Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, when uh, Unix security was being designed, this was the foundational principle, the principle of least privilege. An entity should be granted the least amount of privilege necessary to complete its job. Um, let's look at some examples, right? So um, in for the last two or maybe three decades, we've been designing networks with this assumption that if something is in within the network boundary, within my subnet, within my private Wi-Fi, then it's trusted by default. And that's a flawed assumption. Um, here's an example. I have a connected um, switch from Belkin in my house. And it um, if you send it this HTTP packet, it will tell you whether the switch is on or off. Uh, worse, if you send this other HTTP packet, it'll turn a switch on or turn a switch off. Um, so anyone who is on my Wi-Fi network can control this switch. And think about it, that's not ideal, right? You might, you might have some guests in your house that want to check some email and you give them Wi-Fi access to check their email. That doesn't mean they should have control over things in your house. Um, and this gets really, really bad if it happens in industrial settings where you know, a contractor may suddenly get control over some critical machine of the, the factory. That shouldn't be allowed. Um, so this assumption that systems and traffic within a network boundary can be trusted is flawed. And oftentimes, even when we have really strong network boundaries, um, they tend to be very porous, right? So um, this is a this is an example of uh, someone at DEF CON 27. They showed that uh, they were able to pawn a oil rig, right? They were able to, over the internet, attack the corporate network of the company, use the corporate network to hop into the drilling control network of the oil rig, and then use that to, to get, uh, get admin access on the controllers. Um, so from that talk, this, this quote stood out to me, which is, a lot of people say their industrial control systems are air-gapped, uh, but what they mean is that they think their, their industrial control systems are air-gapped. And this has been proven and shown time and time again that uh, these kind of, even in these controlled environments, uh, network boundaries tend to be porous. Uh, this was a study that showed that uh, a large amount of uh, industrial control traffic is visible uh, at ISPs and IXPs. Uh, and what's worse, because a lot of traditional sort of legacy industrial control protocols weren't designed with security in mind, when it's visible, it's really, really weak and unprotected. And they found that 96% of that industrial control traffic was completely unprotected and vulnerable. So this assumption that all systems and traffic within network boundary can be trusted is flawed. And we, we're already realizing this in modern IT departments. Uh, this is a paper from Google where they talk about how um, as companies adopt mobile and cloud technologies, the perimeter, the boundary is becoming uh, increasingly difficult to enforce. As you dig further into that paper, they go, key assumptions in the perimeter model are no longer hold. Uh, the physical boundary isn't the boundary of the enterprise, right? I mean, think about it. We're all working from home right now, right? We're not inside the enterprise building. Uh, so Google's experience has proven that this, this faith in network boundaries is misguided. Rather, one should assume that the intronal network is fraught with danger, just like the public internet. And we should design our systems with that assumption. And access should solely depend on uh, credentials and keys. Uh, this is obviously now being codified into books and standards. There's a standard from NIST that talks about uh, how to implement the so-called zero trust architecture. Uh, what's important to note here is that it doesn't mean there is no trust in the system. It just means that there is the system puts no trust in the network perimeter. Trust in the system must come from somewhere else. And the five sort of fundamental principles they lay out is that the network is always assumed to be hostile, just like the Google paper. Uh, internal and external threats are exist on the network at all times, and network locality should not be sufficient in deciding trust in a network. You know, just like I said before, uh, just because a guest is in my in my Wi-Fi network 
doesn't mean they have they should have control over my air conditioning or my TV or, or something like that, right? Um, same applies for industrial settings. So locality is insufficient for trust. Um, every device user and network flow must be authenticated and authorized. And policies must be dynamic and calculated based on as many data sources as possible. Uh, the first three points here are really about don't trust the network. And the last two points are about have strong authentication and authorization and policies over, over your system. And we'll, we'll dive deeper into those last two points in quite a bit of detail as we move forward. Uh, but before we do that, let's define security for our purposes. So for our purposes, security is the, it's the degree of resistance of encountering bad things, right? Uh, someone shouldn't be able to control my machine if they're not allowed to control my machine, right? Uh, that's, that's our, it's the degree of resistance to that. Uh, privacy is about an individual or a group to control, the ability of an individual or a group or an organization to control the flow of information about themselves. Uh, an individual should, should, have a con should have control over what information about them is revealed. A um, business should have control over their proprietary information and they should be able, in a position to choose based on the principle of least privilege who gets to see the data in what situations. And finally, trust is the willingness of one party to rely on the actions of another party, right? Their willingness of a machine to rely on a command from a, a web service or a user. Similarly, the willingness of a service to rely on the data that arrives from a machine. Um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about trust. And what's important to note here is that security, privacy, and trust are really application layer concerns, right? They, they, these decisions are based on information that only the application actually has, right? The shared underlying infrastructure doesn't know who is the right entity to trust in what situation. Um, we've seen that networks can't really apply security policies in a granular way. So um, IoT application developers do not have easy to use tools and libraries um, and infrastructure to granularly control, granularly control these application layer concerns that affect their systems. And that's what we're building at Occam. At Occam, we're building a collection of open source tools um, for a device to communicate securely, privately, and trustfully with cloud services and other devices. So let's dive into the components of what Occam is made up of. Uh, the first uh, component is this application layer routing protocol. So what it provides is this ability in a transport agnostic way to move messages over multiple hops of application layer endpoints. So you can say, move a message from my phone uh, to a web server and from that web server to a particular device. Or you can say that from, move a message from a Bluetooth peripheral to my phone, to a web service, then to some other device. Um, these kinds of sort of network um, uh, flows of messages, um, you can kind of craft the route of your message over multiple application layer endpoints. Um, and it does that, it, we provide that in a, a way that is agnostic of the underlying IoT transport protocol. So it works the same whether the underlying protocol is UDP or TCP or LoRaWAN or Zigbee, et cetera. And it's a really lightweight protocol, but what it allows is a mechanism to decouple all the protocols we will build on top from the underlying uh, uh, specific transports. And then we have plugins for various transports. So there's a plugin for UDP, there's a plugin for uh, TCP, and there will there in the future there'll be plugins for things like LoRaWAN, NB IoT, Zigbee, et cetera. So that was the first component. Um, the second component we must think about as we, as we think about uh, the tools needed to do zero trust is machine identity. So um, in a zero trust network, since there is no implicit trust in network boundaries, trust must be based on the identification, authentication, and authorization of the sender of a message. So trust must be rooted in the identity that we perceive for a machine. And a critical tool that's needed there is cryptographic keys. And um, the vault interface in the Occam uh, system is an abstraction over various 
cryptographically capable hardware that's available in the market. So it could be the microchip ATCC608 module or an ARM trust zone environment or Azure Key Vault in the cloud. It's an abstraction over uh, popular TPMs, TEs, hardware security modules, secure enclaves, whatever name you use for them. Essentially, these, these um, hardware that, are, that specialize in storing cryptographic keys and using those keys for uh, uh, various cryptographic operations. Um, and we have plugins for various, uh, uh, various such vault implementations or add-ons, and we're adding more of those as we, as we go forward. Um, the third thing we have to think about is that all messages that are received on the network must be checked for integrity. So in a zero trust network, all packets that are received on the network are immediately suspicious, right? Because we don't trust the network. So uh, we need really strong cryptographic primitives that must be used to validate that the message wasn't tampered on route. And this is especially important. It's in fact critical to the success of the zero trust uh, network goal that we're going after uh, because the identity of the sender of a message is also perceived based on the message, right? Because we don't trust an IP address on the network to be an identifier. Uh, we need the identity of the sender of the message to be proven as part of the message delivery itself which means that unless we have that data integrity guarantee, um, we have nothing in a, in a zero trust system. We're forced to place our trust in the network boundary and we don't wanna do that. So um, in, in the Occam system, the component that provides this data integrity guarantee is secure channels. Um, so the Occam secure channel protocol um, is a, is, starts off with a handshake between an initiator and a responder of the protocol it uses public key cryptography, the keys that were previously stored in our vault implementation. And it uses that, those public, that public key cryptography between the initiator and the responder to exchange a few messages and arrive at a shared secret. In this exchange, the actual private keys are never transported over the network. None of the secret material is transported over the network. Instead, um, the shared secret is mathematically derived by exchanging uh, messages. Um, and then once we have that shared secret, we can then use the more performant authenticated encryption or, or sym symmetric key cryptography to then um, maintain confidentiality and integrity on our secure channel. So Occam secure channel design is based on uh, several modern secure channel implementations um, uh, that are very common in end-to-end human-to-human encrypted messaging systems like Signal, uh, WhatsApp, et cetera. All right, so what we get out of these secure channels is this, especially as they are layered on top of that application route, uh, layer routing uh, protocol, is that we get end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. So messages are encrypted at the source of the data and they're decrypted at the destination of the data. And anything in the middle uh, doesn't get to see or manipulate the data in any form. Uh, and if they try to manipulate it, we would be able to detect that it was manipulated. This is how we're able to apply the principle of least privilege. Uh, so by having this end-to-end -end encrypted secure channel, uh, we can then enforce who we reveal a particular piece of information to and in what situations. So with all of this put together and certain uh, components you expect from a secure messaging system or a messaging system in general, like PubSub, uh, all of that put together, you get the the first layer of the Occam system, which is the end-to-end -end encrypted secure messaging layer. The second layer of the Occam system is all about identities, credentials, and trust. Uh, and we'll dive deeper into the second layer as we go forward. But essentially, it's all about managing the life cycle of keys, uh, providing identification protocols, authentication protocols, authorization, uh, policies, rules, et cetera. So all of this put together is what the Occam system is made up of. Uh, this is a high-level view of the functionality. This functionality is available in multiple programming languages. So we have a Rust library, a C library, and an Elixir library. Um, and we have add-ons for various specific integrations. So for example, we have an add-on for Telegraph, which is a execd plugin uh, that launches OccamD uh, as an execd plugin of Telegraph. And uh, we have an add-on for InfluxDB, which we'll dive deeper into as we go forward. In the future, we plan to have uh, libraries in other programming languages, and we also have planned to have integration with uh, several other uh, systems uh, like Kafka. So 
Uh, let's see how Occam can help in typical deployments that combine the Influx Data Platform and IoT. Um, so let's take this, um, this example of a logistics company that is tracking some sensor data in connected trucks. Um, maybe we want to track the temperature of the shipment and the tire pressure and the vibration of the engine to do predictive maintenance, et cetera. Right? So we want to collect a bunch of readings about things that are going on inside our trucks. And we use Telegraph to do that. Uh, and this Telegraph wants to report the data to InfluxDB in the cloud. This could be a self-hosted InfluxDB or um, InfluxDB cloud. So what we want to do is think through how we will approach security, privacy, and trust in this system. So InfluxDB has two built-in mechanisms uh, for security. The first one is um, a TLS. The second one is tokens. Um, so the TLS functionality, uh, the docs say, provides enabling, um, enabling TLS encrypts the communication between client and InfluxDB. And uh, when it's configured with a signed certificate, uh, then, it, then it also allows you to verify the authenticity of the InfluxDB server. Uh, the first half of the statement is really only for testing and development, um, because if you do uh, encryption uh, without authentication, then an attacker could simply uh, be a man in the middle and re-encrypt. So never use that in sort of a production environment. Always use uh, the, the signed certificate option that they provide here whenever you deploy something like this. So if you use a signed certificate, um, then a truck can establish trust uh, that it is in fact talking to the intended InfluxDB instance. That's great, but let's dive into how exactly that trust is established. Um, so the device on the truck uh, will have some kind of a root trust store. Um, if the device is running Linux, this is typically uh, the Mozilla Firefox browser's root trust store. And as of October 15th, this had 148 trusted parties. And these 148 parties are free to create uh, subordinate trusted parties. So in reality, there are thousands of trusted parties. And if any one of these thousands of trusted parties issues a certificate that pretends to be InfluxDB server you're talking to, then the truck would believe that certificate, right? Um, and think that it is in fact talking to the intended uh, InfluxDB server. And these kinds of, sort of major uh, certificate authorities um, they get compromised quite a bit, right? There's generally like one or two such events every year. Uh, um, on the right here, I have a list of uh, a few of the recent events. So um, in an IoT system, you don't want to do that. You don't want to expose your device that only needs to talk to a few services to such a large, large attack surface. And if the server's identity can be spoofed, um, if all the server is doing is collecting data, then it might be okay someone can just steal our data. But it's worse if the server is also sending control instructions because all of these bad things can happen then, right? Uh, you know, if you, someone could send an instruction to our truck to stop running, or someone could send malware to our truck um, to disable some critical safety component, or they could send a software update and make the truck a part of a botnet. All of those things become possible if the server identity can be spoofed. So that trust model um, is okay for web browsers because web browsers have to trust lots of websites and they can afford to run really complex infrastructure that can identify breaches and manage revocation. So for example, Google runs a log of every certificate ever issued since 2013 called the Certificate Transparency Log, right? And they can run that and they can require uh, certificate authorities to comply with it. Uh, Firefox runs um, this, their, their certificate revocation list. My, Microsoft runs that too and manages that with software upset, updates, et cetera. So this is really complex, expensive infrastructure uh, that we cannot afford to run. And anyways, this, this is a massive attack surface that we as an IoT device vendor don't want to expose ourselves to. So instead, IoT devices shouldn't base their trust in the web API. There should instead be an application controlled public key infrastructure that manages the key life cycle, revocation, and pinning of chains of trust. This is one of the functionalities Occam provides. Um, so we'll manage the key life cycle for you. We'll provide authentication protocols. We already looked at the secure channel uh, example a little bit, and we provide the, 
basically life cycle events like rotation and revocation of keys um, throughout the life of a device or a service. So now let's look at uh, the second uh, security um, functionality that's baked into InfluxDB, and that's uh, tokens. And um, uh, the docs say that InfluxDB uh, tokens uh, ensure secure interaction between users and data through, um, through these authentication tokens. So what they really allow us to do is granularly control which measurement can be reported by an entity that presents a specific token. So for example, we can say that a sensor in truck one can only report measurements about truck one. Uh, we can say a pressure sensor can only report pressure. And this is great, right? This is super granular, careful control. And however, in practice, this presents some complex challenges for IoT uh, systems. Um, so first of all, let's say we have 100,000 trucks. Uh, then we have to somehow generate and deliver unique tokens to each of these 100,000 trucks. Um, if, to if a token is not unique, then truck one could report about truck two, which would mean that truck one can spoof entity of truck two, or worse, an attacker can spoof for entities, which would be even worse, guys, okay? because if the tokens are not unique and they steal one token, they can use that one token to create millions of fake trucks called the Sybil attack, right? So essentially, unless we have unique tokens, we can't have data integrity in, in, in the system um, or a guarantee of data integrity in the system. So you have to somehow come up with a way of um, managing such a large number of tokens. Uh, another problem is uh, storage of these tokens. So if these tokens are being used for authentication, then such identity secrets should be hard to steal. And typically, if you issue this token to the device, it will probably sit on the file system or in memory. And that's not a very safe place. You know, if the truck is parked on the side of the road, someone could very easily steal a token from the truck. Um, so we need better mechanisms of storage of these, uh, these identity secrets. Uh, we also need a revocation mechanism. So um, if we suspect that a particular token has been compromised, we could revoke it from the database. But that would mean that we would kill the functionality of a device out in the field, right? A truck out in the field would become inoperational because we decided to revoke the token. Um, and that's not ideal, right? We don't want the truck to become unusable for some reason in the field. Um, and of course, manually visiting every truck every time you want to do some kind of revocation is obviously very costly and prohibitive. Um, similarly, to minimize the likelihood of such compromises, we would ideally, in good security practice, want to rotate these tokens at a frequency, a small frequency. And this is obviously very hard if we have to do this uh, for hundreds of thousands of trucks. And, and every time we do this, you have to go to do this manually. That's not ideal, right? So we need some automatic mechanism to do rotation of these tokens at scale. So let's see how Occam can help. Um, so uh, this, is our, this is our original picture. We have Telegraph reporting to InfluxDB. Uh, we can run Occam, <coughs> excuse me, you can run Occam as an exec D plugin next to that telegraph. That's the, that's the bar in orange in this picture. Um, and then we can run the Occam influx add-on as a sidecar to your influx DB deployment. And with that in place, it's pretty easy to integrate with telegraph. Uh, like I said, we, we work as a exec D plugin and understand the exec D protocol. Um, so this is what your, your telegraph your pond would look like uh, when invoking Occam D from exec D um, in Telegraph. And once you do this, you get lots of very interesting benefits. Um, so each truck can now have a unique identity key or have unique identity keys that are stored safely in hardware and cannot be stolen or exfiltrated. Uh, private keys can never have to leave the secure environment. They're generated in the secure environment, they're used in the secure environment, and they're revoked uh, while they were still in the secure environment. These private secrets never leave um, uh, that secure environment. And you get the ability to operate with a variety of secure environments baked into the, the various Occam SDKs. Um, and so if your device is a ARM device, we can leverage ARM trust zone. 
if you're early in your in the life cycle of your development, you can include a uh, secure uh, security module like the microchip ADCC608, which provides some really strong um, uh, key storage and authentication uh, functionality. Uh, so you get this uh, by integrating with Occam. Second thing you get is um, each truck is now communicating over a secure channel uh, with the InfluxDB service. And the secure channel is mutually authenticated. There's a guarantee of data integrity. Uh, there's a cryptographic guarantee of confidentiality. This channel is end-to-end -end encrypted. So we'll dig into this a little bit more as we go further, but essentially uh, we can cater to really complex IoT topologies. Uh, this secure channel is lightweight and is designed for IoT systems. So you know the overhead is only a few bytes um, and, and memory consumption is pretty low uh, while maintaining the secure channel. It's really it's designed to be friendly to occasionally connected devices uh, and provide some really nice cryptographic properties like forward secrecy, key compromise, impersonation, protection, et cetera, which are details I wouldn't go into, but essentially what they provide is robustness even when there is failure. Even when there was a little bit of a compromise, your channel can still remain secure. And this kind of thing is, is important because IoT devices go out in the field and then uh, even if there was there was some kind of compromise. We don't. We it's too costly to dig them out of you know some installed uh, location or get the trucks home or you know do all that kind of thing. So this kind of robustness in the design is very important. All right. So now on top of that, you get um, this entire infrastructure for um, identity and credential management. Um, so like I said, uh, your identity keys of the trucks uh, now get a managed lifecycle. They can be rotated, revoked, uh, and all of this can be managed with very simple policies. Um, and finally, uh, another interesting thing you get here is the Occam InfluxDB add-on that integrates within the, the InfluxDB API to get granular, short-lived, unique authorization tokens and leases them to, to, to individual devices and provides them with precise control over which device is, report, is authorized to report what measurements. So instead of um, this, these long-lived tokens that you would have to somehow deliver to your devices, you now get short-lived tokens that can be rotated, easily rotated and revoked, and they come with leases uh, that expire, um, and, and the Occam add-on just takes care of all of that for you. Uh, and we only use these tokens for authorization and instead use the uh, cryptographic keys stored in secure hardware for authentication. Now, on all of this uh, sort of foundational infrastructure, we can then start building higher level protocols. Uh, so one example of such a protocol is the Occam enrollment protocol. So here's the problem at hand, right? You've got a truck and you've got InfluxDB running in the cloud somewhere. Somehow you have to give this truck the credentials needed to start reporting data to that InfluxDB. And you have to do that to hundreds of thousands of trucks. And uh, you also may have to give the truck information about which endpoint to talk to, what frequency, some bunch of configuration data, et cetera, right? And so this bootstrap problem can be pretty challenging. And I've seen um, in various IoT deployments, people tackle this problem in different ways, right? Oftentimes there are ad hoc protocols that they'll come up with uh, that have weaknesses around, like for example, uh, uh, you know, sometimes keys are transported. So the private key of the truck is given to the truck by some server. And that's not ideal because that would leak the private keys, right? And so these kinds of mistakes are very easy to make uh, when you're trying to come up with like an ad hoc protocol. Um, so instead, um, uh, what we've done is we've designed a robust um, our enrollment protocol that is based on well-proven uh, uh, cryptographic primitives. So the way this works is uh, you have some kind of an onboarding device, and let's say let's say a phone or a handheld, and the phone has been already onboarded onto the the uh, Occam InfluxDB add-on, and, and um, 
the this this trust could have been bootstrapped manually and maybe it took 20 minutes to bootstrap the trust that's fine at least it doesn't take you 20 minutes every time you go to those 100,000 trucks right so once or maybe you had to do some manual, manual setup to run a few commands and bootstrap this first trust once you have this handheld device um it can request the um the Occam enrollment uh, service to issue a pre-key bundle for a particular uh, truck. And it, co it collects a bunch of these pre-key bundles. Then you take this device and you go to each individual truck. You establish a local secure channel with that truck uh, over Bluetooth or uh, a Wi-Fi access point or something like that. And then you share that pre-key pre bundle with the truck. And after that, uh, the truck can establish, the truck now knows the route to the InfluxDB instance, and um, it has the credentials needed to establish trust with that InfluxDB endpoint. Um, so what you get is a mutually authenticated end-to-end -end encrypted secure channel. And this Occam enrollment protocol is based on X3DH or extended triple Diffie-Hellman, which is a well-proven primitive. It's used in Signal and WhatsApp uh, to do asynchronous bootstrap uh, of a mutually authenticated secure channel. So our use case is similar, but kind of rotated, um, but uh, we use well-established primitives instead of coming up with an ad hoc uh, protocol. And enrollment is just one example of these kind of cryptographic protocols that can be built on top of a strong foundation of end-to-end um, -end encrypted messaging and uh, uh, identity and credentials. Uh, so here are some other examples. Uh, secure software updates is a very common problem. Uh, so a generalized protocol for secure software updates would be I, would make a lot of sense. Another interesting problem is finding a lost device. The example that comes to my mind here is the contrast between how Apple does the Apple Find My protocol versus how uh, you know those uh, those GPS trackers that you buy, like a Tile or something like that how they do finding of a lost device, right? Um, in one case, th there are two ways to do this, to solve this problem. One way is to always collect location of your device and store it in a central server. So if a device is lost, you leave it on a park bench or something, then it's, it's, it's continuing to report its location, uh, maybe through a Bluetooth or a connection or directly, and you know where it is and you can go find it. The problem with this is that this creates a database of, the location of your device at all times in a central server, the service provider of that find my lost device. Versus the Apple find my approach, which uses a cryptographic protocol. Uh, so when the device is lost and it starts broadcasting a public key uh, over Bluetooth and nearby devices uh, encrypt their location to that public key and upload it to Apple servers. The end result is the Apple servers are not tracking the location of these devices at all times. Instead, there's a strong cryptographic protocol that enables secure and private find my lost device functionality. So these kinds of examples of protocols become very easy to build on top of that, that foundation that we've already talked about. All right, now this final piece I want to, uh, I want to highlight is because we built our cryptographic protocols for secure channel or credential exchange, identification, authentication, enrollment, et cetera, on this foundation of application layer routing, uh, we can do this in really complex IoT topologies. So oftentimes what I've seen in the past is that, um, you know, you'll have really strong primitives in one ecosystem, but weak primitives in another ecosystem. And oftentimes, IoT systems are, are a convergence of various different types of technologies, right? So your first hop may be Bluetooth uh, in a network communication, and the second hop may be UDP. Or your first hop may be LoRaWAN, the second hop may be UDP. And these complex topologies, um, you lose your security and privacy guarantees. So in a traditional setting where, let's say, we had some kind of you know uh, occupancy tracker that was tracking our, uh, our presence of a truck in a space. Uh, and then over LoRaWAN, uh, it was communicating that information to the gateway. Uh, the gateway would see all the data because secure channels 
the, the LoRaWAN secure channel will end at the gateway. And then if you do a different secure channel like uh, DTLS or TLS, then that secure channel would start at the gateway. So the gateway would then become this point of underbelly. Versus in the Occam system, because we had this underlying end-to-end -end encrypted routing infrastructure uh, or end-to-end -end application layer routing infrastructure, our secure channel can be end-to-end -end from the source of the data to the final destination of the data. And all parties in the middle uh, are excluded because of the principle of least privilege. They just need to route information. They don't need to see or manipulate the information. So that's one example. Uh, and you can very easily implement that uh, with the telegraph config like this, where instead of having one hop in the route, you have two hops in the route and that's it. It's an end-to-end end -end encrypted channel. Uh, this can get arbitrarily complex. You can have any number of hops in these routes and you still get an end-to-end -end encrypted channel. So the final example I wanna take is, um, is a scenario that I think is very common where you have an industrial setting. Let's say you have some kind of industrial machine and uh, you have telegraph running collecting, let's say vibration data. And uh, if the machine starts to vibrate in weird ways, or if the pressure of some valve reach, reaches a certain threshold, the machine should be shut down immediately. And that decision is critical enough that it's, it's, it's not ideal to send the data all the way up to the influx DB in the cloud to make that decision, right? So people will run a edge instance of influx DB or the tick stack and make those decisions at the edge. At the same time, there may be data that needs to land, that still needs to land at the influx DB in the cloud. And um, with traditional mechanisms, you would end up then basically revealing all the data along its path. Whereas in case of um, Occam sort of granular control over uh, routing and end-to-end -end encrypted uh, channels, you can control what data is revealed to the edge instance of the InfluxDB and what data is revealed only to the cloud instance of InfluxDB. Um, and similarly, when instructions are coming back from your cloud deployment um, back to your machines, uh, then also you can control what information is revealed to which parties in your system. This type of control and ability to apply a principle of least privilege is very critical. Um, here's an example from the same guy who published the, the oil rig hack, where um, he points out that oftentimes uh, various IoT systems like a IoT light bulb company and a IoT connected car company or a washing machine company, they will end up sharing the same shared infrastructure. Like maybe they have a shared API that they all rely on. And if there's a vulnerability, what they were able to do was find vulnerabilities in such shared APIs. And when that breaks, and these are authentication and authorization vulnerabilities, and when that breaks, that, that vulnerability trickles down to all the connected bulbs and all the connected washing machines and all the connected cars, right? So these kinds of sort of super systemic IoT flaws become um, feasible in the traditional uh, infrastructure. Versus if you have an end-to-end -end encrypted system, those third-party APIs typically are only providing routing and maintenance type of functionality. So if you have a vendor for a particular device, that needs to see maintenance data about the device, uh, then with Occam's end-to-end -end encrypted routing, you can control that, that information and say that only the maintenance events should go to the vendor and your business critical information should only come to you. So that kind of granular control becomes feasible um, with the Occam tool chain. So this is the overall tool chain. Uh, and as you can see, it has lots of moving parts and components. Uh, but our goal is to make it all really easy for you to use, which is why we expose them as uh, simple to use APIs and libraries, or even uh, plugins to existing systems uh, as Occam add-ons. Um, and the end result of all of this is that you end up with dependable data in your influx TV. Um, so, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Please uh, come check out Occam. As I said, we are open source and hungry to learn more about your use cases and help you build them. Uh, come check us out on GitHub. And that's me on Twitter.
Thank you all.